There you go. So yes, welcome at the TIA CSC level two. And as everybody knows, the TIA is the International Association of Community Services Chaplains. You are with a level two training session. If you're here by accident, you're still welcome. <laughs> if you're here and you have enrolled, fantastic. I'm happy to see you. Um, if you're here just for a refresher, that's also fine. We, we do refreshers and you do not have to pay for a refresher necessarily. But if you want to bless the church, full gospel church in Irene, with that money, you're most welcome to do so. Um, and the other thing about that is um, uh, when you, when you, when I use the term, as, as it says up here, DICSC, it means the International Association. But I, when I see, say CSC, it just means plainly community services chaplains for the duration of this course. It's just in short for what we are and what we are, our ministry is about. So but before anything starts off, nothing can start without prayer. Let us just pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we want to glorify you this evening. We want to thank you for this opportunity where we as people with a ministry call upon our lives, Lord, we just want to invest our time, our effort inside of our communities. I pray, Lord God, that you will bless us abundantly. And as we seek your face in this day and in this time of Pentecost, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will just lead us, feed us and sustain us in the precious name of Jesus. We pray for the ministry orders, Lord, we pray for every person that's in the ministry, every chaplain here on this platform and their families, Father God, that we will be blessed, blessed abundantly through the grace and lordship of the King of Kings and the Lord of all, Jesus Christ, Messiah and King. Amen and amen. So, yes, let me just share my screen with everybody. So, um, all right. All right. Oh, I forgot and I, um, I forgot to tell you, if, if you want to save some data and, and you want to just press your um, um what you call it your camera little camera on the on the screen what happens with zoom is the data you sent the same is coming and going the whole time so if your camera switch off of course you will just receive you'll just receive um uh, you have to pay for the receiving part of the data so um, for me it's not a problem because i've got unlimited um wi-fi and, and and that's quite good um but let's start off with confidentiality and the clergy client privilege on page 10. And as you know, chaplain, confidentiality is about how the chaplain handles information that comes to him or her. Because the information that's coming to you is kind of, you know, it's information that needs to be respected. I, I guess, you know, you can weaponize information that comes to you. You can weaponize any information, any kind of an information, like putting out threats to people and tell them, listen, if you do not come to church, I'm going to tell your wife that you cheated on her, <laughs> something like that. And then also we've got here in South Africa what we call the Papia Act or the Poppy Act. Um, and that is the Protection of Private Information Act. So we also have to protect the not only the client-clergy kind of relationship, we we'll also have to consider the Poppy Act at this stage. We're like a soundboard for some people out there. The basics of communication skills are the ability to listen well. And many chaplains, they really struggle to listen well. As chaplains, we understand ideally that we wish to promote the kingdom of God and fulfill the Great Commission in our world. It must be understood, however, that the CSC should not attempt to be the pastor to the members of the workplace for that matter. We are just there to be of comfort to them, to, to be the compassion of Christ in the world. There are many godly and conscious Christians who are committed to their local um, assemblies or their denomination, as a CSC, you will be a valuable resource and a minister for them. But our philosophy and role is not to build our kingdom, but rather God's kingdom. And this is what chaplaincy is all about, to build the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so this soundboard, and as we soundboard, you know, with people, of course, they will, you'll have to train yourself in the basics art of communication because the reason why God gave you two ears and one mouth is to listen twice as much as you speak. So um, this is our perception. And, and, and as you see this picture from the start here, the balls aren't moving in circles. Look, and then let me explain. It looks like the balls is, is moving in a circle. You see that? But look what happens, actually. It's not moving in a circle. Because each ball is moving in this straight line. 
This was taken from brush up. There's the straight lines. The ball is just moving in straight lines. Can you see that? Watch the one ball out at a time. This is an example how perception could be different from reality. This is one of our sayings in chaplaincy, our perception is reality. One of the most important axioms in chaplaincy is not to say you perceive the balls is moving in a circle. That's so. It's actually moving in lines. So it says, don't be just mental. Remember, it's your, it's just your perception. For example, you walk into the bank and you see everybody sitting there and you think they are rude. <laughs> it might be your perception to think they are rude. Maybe they're not. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Most probably they're not because it's their job to be of worth or of, of, of client service. Confidentiality, what does confidentiality mean to you as a chaplain? So in short, confidentiality is a trust to keep. If you look at the word confidentiality and confidence, it speaks of trust, people trusting you. Now the definition, the book definition of that is an agreement between two or more persons based on faith, acknowledging that transactions, both verbal and written, are held in trust as personal, private, and are to be professionally protected. So, so this is what it is. Confidentiality is based on, on what? On faith. It's based, based on the fact that I trust a person with the information and acknowledging that through a verbal and a, or a written declaration or transaction between you and the person you trust. So this can be a personal or a private conversation and needs to be professionally protected. Confidentiality will cost you a great deal, chaplain. When you protect the people uh, as confidences, it will cost you, but it will even cost you more when you break a confidence. You protect sometimes the wrongs of others, and that's all under you know, confidentiality. Let's move on. <clears throat> The chaplains are counselors and must learn to think about confidentiality in terms of personal confidences as well as agency confidences. Now, you need to remember this as a chaplain that we are, you know, we categorize confidentiality in this way. When you speak about personal confidences, it might be a person in your congregation. It might be a person in your family. But an agency confidence is, for example, when the agency trusts you with information about certain things certain um, projects, they trust that you won't tell the other employees about the project. That's what we call agency confidences. These, these are the two types of confidences. Okay, confidentiality belongs to the client or the agency. This will be in your test. Confidentiality is the chaplains to protect. So to who does it belong? I may ask even the question a little bit different. Like, for example, confidentiality belongs to the Chaplain is the clients to protect. It makes no sense. So it needs to be false then, of course. Now, there's some areas of concern about confidentiality. And we get the five, you know, five important areas um, the chaplain must have and understand to protect information in the service of others. <clears throat> Yay. <laughs> so first off, we get the person-to-person -person kind of confidentiality. Having confidential relationships with employees they serve, they must have absolute confidence in the chaplain. No trust, no confidence. So if people look at you, what do they see? Do they see a trustworthy person or do they see a kind of person that cannot wait to get out of the room? I'm reminded of the story about the priests. I like to tell the story, but it's about the priests. They would come, come together, four of them, and the one said to the others, listen, guys, we need to confess to one another to set ourselves free of all of the sins we have done. And the first one starts and he said, you, you know, you know, guys, when I'm finished with my sermon on a Sunday, I cannot wait to light my cigar. I just want to confess today. And the other one said, you know, guys, I'm also, you know, at blame because 
after communion, and we use Ulbra and Sherry, after communion, I empty all the glasses that's not been taken, as well as the bottle. So I just need to confess this. And the third one said, you know, guys, I also got a problem. I've got a problem with, with women. I, I, I just love them. And, and I just want to confess with you guys and say, I'm very sorry. I hope you can forgive me. So the fourth one was very quiet. And, and he just listened and observed the other clergy people. And, and they said to, to him, but, but what about you? Aren't you going to confess about, what, you know, about your sins? He said, I cannot do that, man. They said, yes, you better, because it will help you to be free. So he says, yes, I've got a problem. You know, I'm the biggest gossip in town, and I cannot wait to get out of this place. And this is what, the, what privacy is about, and that is what person-to-person confidence is. If you do not have any trust, in, there won't be any confidences, because confidence relates to trust, and trust relates to confidences. Then we have the agency area of concern, or the um, organization, it will soon, you will soon see they may, may, may just trust the chaplain with privileged information or private information or dynamics within the organization. They will trust you with keys. They will trust you with passwords. They will, they will follow you because they trust you. They, that's why they will call you and ask you for your opinion regarding certain things because then they'll know that you are a prayer warrior, you're a person that can be trusted and you're, you're a confident kind of person. Uh, and then we have the media. The confidentiality regarding media can become a real challenge to us as chaplains, as well as an issue of pride and ego for the chaplain. Because when we have the newspapers on our necks, they want to know more about the scene or the accident that transpired, and they know you, you were the chaplain on site. Um, whoever that is, I mean, you cannot share any information like that with the media. Um, <clears throat> contacts with the press are normally not forbidden by the agency. They do not forbid it, but yet you should always respect it as a chaplain. You should respect and always be cleared by the, the organization to speak to the, um, to the media uh, beforehand, even before you. Bef- you cannot speak to the media and then phone the boss and tell him, listen, sir, is it okay if I speak to the media? All right, I just... Um, you know, ask the reporter to withdraw what I just told him. They won't. <laughs> Always check with that agency before giving interviews to any a news agency. Then we have the accessibility for ministry. Remember now, confidentiality, it's, you know, it, it, it's a ministry um, mandate. We need to be accessible, confidential. Deals, it deals with the chaplain's ability to be free. Um, with, and, and of course, and mo- mobile in their work environment. The community service chaplain will be given as, um, access to areas of security and privacy like no other person in the unit. Um, the chaplain will soon learn that they will be able to ac- access hard files and computer files without other employees questioning their actions or what they are doing there. Sometimes you'll walk and jump the queue because you know what's going on. You're there to minister. Um, and that's what chaplaincy is all about. It's ministry of presence. Your main goal as a chaplain is ministry of presence. So you'll always be present. You'll always be, you know, ministering through your presence. Even if they just see you, you're ministering. You do not have to have a Bible and a prayer um, a moment. Nothing like that. When they see you, they know you're there for them. And you're busy ministering to them. Um, and that's also how Jesus ministered to the people outside the gates and of the temple and, and of the designated holy places. You remember the three designated holy places, of course, of level one is the, um, no, not the church back in the day. There was no church. It was a temple, synagogue, and the, um, um, the, the tabernacle. Remember those? Um, so, yes, Jesus always went outside of these designated, designated holy places, but he still ministered out there. He didn't walk with the Torah under his arm and spent hours praying for these people. He, he was just there. It was ministry of presence. He's the perfect example of ministry of presence. He was under a tree with Zagis. He was at the seashore with thousands of people. The list goes on. Now, interdepartmental need to know, you know, confidences. Some info needs to stay inside of the department you serve, and it's not your place to give out those information. Some things are held private for a reason. And if they invite you to a meeting and 
pro private information was discussed and it leaks out of that room, they'll soon realize, you know, it's only the chaplain that could have said something like that. Um, for example, when the police and you're a police community service chaplain and the police officers invite you to be involved with the, with the raid that evening and they tell you, listen, pastor, please, chaplain, we're going to go on a raid on the, on the night of the 2nd of June. Would you please come with us and be of assistant, on, you know, as a chaplain? And then you'll tell all your friends, listen, guys, don't come this side. There's going to be a roadblock, a raid and all of that. Don't, and, and you know what's happening then? Um, your buddies, all of your buddies, they will, they will phone their buddies. And soon enough, the whole city will know that there's a raid 12 o'clock tonight. Now, there's some exceptions, you know, about you know, confidentiality. I mean, you know these probably by now. And if you're here for the so million of times, <laughs> these are the three um, exceptions when you can break confidences. Obligation to the agency to ensure that the employee's life, life is protected. This is, of course, the most important thing is that we, we, we report a threat. We report to a, a threat to an individual's life. When a person wants to kill themselves, we need to report that because if they've got suicidal thoughts, we need to tell somebody about that. We have to tell the boss, um, you know, and that's not only suicidal, suicidal ideation because many people will we'll have an ideation, but other people will have a concise plan as to how they're going to kill themselves. And if they've got a concise plan, you'll, you'll need to take it very seriously because they've thought it through and they've probably tried it before. Then we have the second disclaimer, and that's another exception that, you know, if, a, if there's a threat to another person's life and you get to know about that, in other, in other words, homicide, so you get suicide, homicide, and genocide, but if, if, if there's a, a threat to somebody else, for example, the supervisor, the, the spouse or the, or the child in the house, the chaplain has a moral ethical responsibility to the agency and the lives of those who could potentially be affected by the actions of the counselor um, when he acts uh, inappropriately. It is to be understood that the CSC will have to violate confidence if they um, learn of a threat to themselves to somebody else, as well as to the larger community. So we've got suicide, geno um, homicide, and then, of course, genocide. These things you'll have to remember. So, so um, also, when that larger threat is the agency or the workplace this person is reporting at, um, security bridges for money, um, individuals silent after finding defects in equipment, for example, he knows that this, um, this big crane has got a problem and the, the cables can snap or something like that. And he keeps his mouth about that. And you learn about that. And, and he wants to kill somebody on the job site because of his negligence and so on and so forth. You'll have to report those. And also, of course, national security. If you hear somebody's going to plant a bomb, you cannot keep it under the covers because you want to protect confidentiality because you'll sit in jail with this person if you knew about that. So, yes, be careful for that. <clears throat> this, the, the three R's of confidentiality um, is rapport, respect, as well as ramifications. We've got these three. And, um, and the first one is rapport. Um, you, now, rapport can also be um, translated as sympathy or empathy, um, harmony. So, this is the personal relationship or the heartbeat of the chaplain, chaplain's ministry. We've got sympathy for others. We've got empathy for others. We've got, we feel in harmonious, um, harmonious um, relationships. We get involved with them. This is the seed of all our counseling out there. If you are a good counselor, counselor, you probably are having a good rapport. Not report, rapport. Um, <clears throat> for, for example, counseling in the workplace. Without the element of confidentiality, no rapport will ever be established between you and the client. You'll have to have a, um, element of confidentiality. So um, then you can build rapport. They will never trust your, um, uh, what you call it, sympathy, or they will never trust your empathy if you aren't open with them in, in respecting their privacy. And then the second one is respect. The chaplain and client must have mutual respect. Respect, they say, is earned, but also which facilitates effective ministry. So respect 
facilitates a lot of things in our lives. Respect is given and respect is gained when you give it away. Two, it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. If the chaplain does not respect the individual whom they counsel, the chaplain will be hard-pressed to maintain the confidence and he will kind of you know, break confidences if you do not respect each and every person stepping foot in their offices. So we've got rapport, you know, um, feeling um, empathy or sympathy for a person, and then we've got respect, it's a two-way street, and then we've got ramifications. And that's the consequences of protecting or violating confidences of a person. The, it's like the proverbial stone dropped into a pond. If confidence is violated, the ramifications can be embarrassment. Some people will be embarrassed, and what they'll do is they respond to this, and they'll, they'll sue you. They will take you to court, or it can even be a termination of involvement with the organization they're serving, and possibly loss of ministerial credentials because of, you know, that's what we say, and that's what we call ramifications. For example, when you skip a red light, there will be ramifications if the cop sees you, or when the other driver doesn't see you coming from the other end. So there will always be a consequence or a ramifications of our actions. And one of the grand words here is actions. And that's why we say ramifications, because you will pay the price for the choices and decisions you have made. And as a, as a early riser in your ministry, um, just remember these three R's of confidentiality. You want I don't think it's in the test, though, but if you get it, it, was, it mustn't be a surprise. Then also note-taking and, and, and tape recording. I, I do not like any of those because it keeps your mind busy with writing things. And, and then, of course, you cannot make eye contact with your client when you take notes all of the time because many people they will take so many notes. Try not to take notes in front of the person. I mean, the chaplain must know their legal rights concerning note-taking and tape recording because the chaplain, chaplain could easily be subpoenaed to appear, to appear in court with their notes. So if you've got notes about your client base and, 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 and it's not loose papers like this one, the paper, they can subpoena their whole book. So, so I'd rather choose not to take notes. Therefore, when I counsel people, um, I will normally ask them, how many sessions have you been here? They will say two. Okay, so you want to come for the third one? Yes. And I'll, then I'll know probably where I was the previous times because, um, you know, you've got, through the years, you'll, you'll train yourself what you'll train or counsel about on the first session and then what you'll talk about on the second session, the third session and fourth and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, if it's a traumatic incident, you'll probably speak about anxiety the first time, planning the second time, uh, and so on and so on. I mean, you can decide on the topics you want to discuss first or last in your counseling in the areas. Um, but refrain from note taking and tape recording, please, if you can. Um, if you are afraid to, you're going to, you know, forget what you said, <laughs> make a note somewhere, maybe on your backside of your, um, you know, your, your desk pad or your, your desk calendar. The back is the flip side of that. Make something, some notes there. But the thing is, if your notes are sapuna, and say, for example, this is your notebook, and then the, the government will take in your whole book, because if you, if you tore out pages in there, they will rec- realize, you know, recognize the fact that you have tore out pages, and they'll ask you, oh, you want to hide something, chaplain? You want to hide something? It's, it's contempt of court, and you, you can even be arrested for that. Um, so you just be mindful of that. Okay, so let's move on. So we've got privilege, uh, and we've got so much privilege in the places we are working at. Um, <clears throat> but the definition of this, this is, it's a legal implication relating confidentiality between chaplain and client or clergy client privilege. So you should know the agency requirements r- concerning the, the clergy client privilege, because there is a, there's a guideline, you know, because you, you, cannot, you do not have the same relationship as an attorney with a client. The, the same standards doesn't comply with you and the attorney. I mean, we're not attorneys. We're just chaplains or pastors. So, so there is completely a different set of rules in the agency 
for us. Okay. Then you need to know the agency requirements. Please assume nothing. Assume nothing. It is imperative that the CSC not make an automatic assumption of privilege when serving in a volunteer capacity in an organization um, that may not enjoy the, or under, uh, understand or understood protection of privilege laws and so on and so forth. Clergy persons have, however, enjoyed a relatively large amount of latitude in this area in the past. And I've seen this for many years that we have enjoyed a large amount of latitude. This, this area based on what is commonly referred to as the sanctity of the confessional. So, so we, we have really been trusted by our communities. Unless you are in a non-Christian community, nowhere is Christian there. Now that is, that is in anything told to a clergy person in confidence and told to the clergy person was acting in the capacity of spiritual advisor. And of course, you would, in most circumstances, remain in, 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 in violated, you know, of the rule of law. So also know the laws of the country, and you need to get informed about these laws. It doesn't help you know the law, but you do not inform yourself about this law. <clears throat> now, what does client cl clergy uh, privilege mean to you as an organization chaplain? How can you further your mission in the organization respecting the, 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 the privilege you have, you have been given to speak to, you know, organization employees? The same rules apply. Respect, well, start with rapport, respect, and ramifications. Because as soon as you break this confidence, there will be a ramification. The same rules apply. Important question is, chaplain, does the chaplain view themselves as a credential chaplain or clergy in the workplace? How do you view yourself? Do you view yourself or when people ask you, are you credentialized or are you a credentialed minister of faith? Or are you a credentialized chaplain? The question is about you now. Because some people may ask you, are you credentialized? Many, I, I don't think in my whole life, in my whole 20 plus, 25 years chaplaincy career, anybody asked me for credentials. I don't know why. Um, I, I always wish they would ask me because I've got a nice card. Uh, but never, ever have asked me for my card or... Um, Sometimes I would present it if, if I see there's some confusion on the face, but I've never been asked, you know, prior to, of entering the hospital, because you sometimes you walk with your Bible, you look important, so you go on your mission. Now, what are the legal requirements of your 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 state or your province in regards to the clergy client privilege? Some states have very little in anything on the books or to deal with client or clergy client privilege. It's in, and also. Attorney-client privilege is more protected by law. So it's, ours is not so much protected by law as with the client and attorney relationship. <clears throat> now, there's some more important questions. Is the chaplain willing to view them? So, okay, I've got this one. Let me just skip this one. I see the duplication. All right, there we go. Um, law in the agency government uh, governing or govern clergy-client privilege, know the law. Know the agency guidelines, inform your client about these. If you find out that the agency guidelines doesn't support the information you have shared with you, you'll have to inform your client to rather shut up. <laughs> but the fact is, chaplains are subject to courts upon us if deemed necessary to gain access to counseling information, especially when notes are being taken. So yes, you have to know the law about that. It won't be in your test, don't worry. There was a case study done. <clears throat> a case study. I hope not your um, my um, system is low on data. It looks like I'm a little bit low. Maybe a loose connection or something here on my side. Okay, but nevertheless, let's move on. A cha as a chaplain works for the local police department, initial training um, empathetically states that not all aspects of personal counseling is to be considered confidential. Did you see this? So some, some workplaces will tell people, not all aspects of personal counseling is to be considered confidential. Information relating to a spouse and child abuse and threats to life and limb are to be taken seriously, but not privately held. In light of this agency's policies, 
discuss the following. Would you say, what do you think about, uh, and, and I would like you to go back to your workbook and do a little bit of study on this, is how does policy a conflict or coincide with your view of ministry or your personal rights? So if you were supposed to know about a child that is, you know, um, not in good shape, it's, it's being treated ill by his parents or his, his, his siblings, um, what do you think is that child's rights? How would you protect those rights? And what about the policy and the conflict therein? What persons would you like to consult with on these issues? Would you consult an attorney? Would you consult your mentor? Would you consult maybe the police? Stay, well, remember, if you consult the police, they will, of course, send somebody to that person's house because children are very important to, to the police. Um, and what biblical theological themes apply to this issue? Because there might be some um, biblical and theological themes that, that can, be, you know, can be drawn out from the Holy Bible and be employed in this case study or in this situation um, you are being, um, you're doing counseling with. All right. So, yes, is there any questions? If there's no questions, can I move on? Okay, let's move on then. I, I told you I'm, we're going to take a break, but I guess we can still push on and uh, see how far we can go with this. Now, you can turn the page to page 16. That page 16. I just also want to turn the page here on my workbook. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so, um, so you need to understand, Chaplain, that counseling and peer support will help the victim or will help the employee to understand and accept their fears as well as their vulnerability. just want to close that. I don't know if you can see that on my side. I see some, something um, that just came up on the screen. So, um, you know, we, we are there to support every peer, but you cannot be every person's peer if you do not even you know, work in their environment. The Webster Dictionary defines peer as an equal person. In other words, um, I, cannot, I cannot be the peer of a mine worker. I'm in the city of mines, you know. There's many mines and minor people in my church, but I'm never their equal because they do another job and they can never be mine. Um, chaplains may have strong relationships with those they serve. But they are not equals. They're not, and they will never be equals um, because they're not in the same role or in the same capacity, capacity involved in your environment. Develop a peer support system, if you will. You can do that because if you're involved in a workplace, you can start out and reach out to people who's experiencing certain, certain uh, elements of anx um, um, angst or stress or whatever you want to do, or alcohol um, abuse and so on and so forth. Chaplains understand peer relationship in a specialized way. We focus on something specific, like something that happened to everybody, like marriage trauma, children trauma, and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, we create and we set up this peer support group to establish better relationship in the working environment, whereas to, we encourage people to speak out about their problems within the workplace. And that will, of course, better the relationship in the workplace. One thing that makes us appear for someone else is simply the fact that we are human and we are breathing air. And that's one thing that makes us peers, and that's that we are human. Peer relationships are defined as follows. Fellow laborers in type or training, and also equal in ranks or status. It may even be veterans of similar experiences like POWs or people of war. Then we've got experiential experiences such as illness. You can set up a support group for illness, people that's got a certain type of illness, maybe cancer patients or maybe HIV, although HIV is easily stigmatized and many people won't come for such uh, peer support groups. We have tried 
many, many years in as when I was still a Metro Police chaplain for, I was a chaplain about a 19, almost 19 years. We always have tried to put up peer support groups for the HIV patients, but they would never come. And upon asking them, we will always realize <clears throat> they, they won't come because they, they are, you know, victimized through stigmatization. And that's not good. And that's, and that's really ill. But anyway, guys, um, then also some people, they will experience grief and you can set up a peer support system for the people suffering from grief. There's so many people that lost somebody, you know, that lost somebody and they are facing this morbid grief. And to get them together, to encourage them together, they can see and, and, and you know, find that some other people are also having the same issues that like theirs and they can help each other out in out from that morbid grief and the situation of loss and also social status and position. So if you invite people, um, you can invite people for peer relationships, of course, a, search, a, a specialized group in illness, a specialized group in grief. You cannot put all of these people in one group because it will be a complete mess, of course. So, and then also social status, uh, shared ethnicity. So if people from a certain culture would want to come together as peer supporters, they come together once a week or once a month or two, um, and they just encourage one another um, regarding um, their ethnicity. And also shared racial heritage that can also be part of the ethnicity group. Then we have a female officer can never, ever really know what it is like to be a male officer, as well as vice versa. A male officer can never know how it feels like a, to be a female officer. The CSC will often work as a peer advisor or support person. The captain may know how it's like to be a sergeant, but the sergeant will never know how it's like to be a chaplain. Once a peer status or rank changes, the ability to relate diminishes. That relationship diminishes. As soon as he becomes a captain and she's still a sergeant, that relationship just diminishes. They will always be respectful to one another because they've, they've done the beat together on the streets, but but that relationship will never be the same. It will just diminish because now all of a sudden she'll have to salute this guy who has been her peer for all of these years. Peer relationships do not always provide the understanding required to identify their needs, which are uh, problem areas for those the CSE serves. So, and also peer relationships is a very rank conscience environment. So you'll have to ask, is there anybody with a rank here today that's not supposed to be here because everybody... Coming to the peer support group, you know, it's probably people that's almost in the same ranking or a little bit lower than their ranking. For example, a general will not easily um, partake in a peer support group with the, with the constables. You will rather take part in a peer support group with commander level and up, you understand? Um, so, yes, the value of peer support is found in the words been there, done that, or I got the t-shirt. That's what we, what we call it. And that's valuable. In the morning, coming on shift, they're not aware of the stress they're, like, they're going to face today. So it's, it's kind of you know, dicey and tricky. Um, peer support is needed because peers relate to each other in a better way. Since they are experienced similar experiences, and they would be best to help each other to understand the situation better. So if a, a shift supervisor Get, the, get his people together and they sit together, maybe drink some tea, chat a little bit. That is peer support. You don't have to establish a formal group, maybe. A formal group is always better. But I mean, when you sit in the tea room and all of the people sitting there, they're encouraging one another. And, and you can facilitate this chapter. You can start it, start it and to, to encourage those people because it will ultimately save the, the company or um, the company or the support group will save the company 1.5 million a year. 1.5 million in a year just for absenteeism. You know, and, and that's amazing stuff. Um, and this is kind of the things you'll have to take to the boss or to the manager and tell him, listen, we need a peer support group because, of course, we will save, we will save you a lot of money. Family and friends do not understand the unique stresses they face, but maybe you can, you can relate to them. You can set up a support group to assist in that regards. And also, chaplain cannot serve as a peer, but can help create a peer support group. So you cannot be their peer 
of course, you're a chaplain. You, you've, you're high, maybe sometimes highly qualified, but sometimes less qualified. But, but you do another job. Your job is a job of compassion, and this is a job of building cars. You, know, you understand? So, so you'll have to, you, you'll have to just build a bridge in, in support and, and, and get probably the best person available to lead this peer support group. Um, <clears throat> so she will have to work with a member of the agency or a committee to help you establishing a, a peer support group or a repertoire of people who is willing to lead these peer support groups in your environment. Um, where you serve as a chaplain in your ministry of presence. Now find a meeting, find a meeting place that's outside of the agency facility. Sometimes the agency cannot afford, you know, for you to, to have meetings outside, but if they can, um, encourage those meetings to be outside. You know, I'm not talking about um, brying and drinking because this is what's happening outside. I'm talking about meeting outside maybe once every quarter just to debrief or just to listen, or just to take in um, the pain others have so that I can gain through their experience. Um, so also find an established model, and you can use that model, if you will, um, because there's many models out there that, that um, like the debriefing model of Mitchell, you can even use that, but, but there's some other models for peer support also. For example, HIV's got a model, and Alcoholics Anonymous got a model, um, Drug abuse has got a special model in establishing a peer support group. And then it, what you'll need to do is you, say, you should select leaders for the group. Remember, we are on level two now. We're not still on level one. Level one seems like a, a Sunday school class in relationship in relation with, with level two. But you'll have, to, you'll have to find leaders and equip them. Um, <clears throat> people that suited to lead, not suited with, su you know, with suit and the tie. Not that kind of, you know, people that's good to lead. They must be genuine in their concern for their fellow employees. They shouldn't be only there for shop steward business. They should be there for, for the care of people. Leaders must be a person of trust also. And then the, the last day over here, as leaders must be non-judgmental. And, and, and people will immediately, you know, relate to their leader or they will reject their leader especially when the leader's got a judgmental kind of behavior and he's not a person of trust. In other words, confidences relates to trust and trust relates to confidences and none of this is applicable to this leader. So what we'll do is we'll rather run than just um, enjoy a peer group support system. So also leaders must understand the following things and you can be of great value of that. You can, you can, lead them in depression classes. You can train them about depression. Now they need to, um, uh, you know, um, speak on depression and address the topic of depression. There's so many ways to do that. I mean, our first level of training, we, we discussed a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. We discussed a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. And you can bring all of these in inside of your sessions, you know. Then also alcohol and drug abuse. You can, of course, you know, uh, read something about that. If you don't know where to go, what to say, you'll just contact one of your fellow counselors or your fellow chaplains. They can be of great help in this regard. As If you want to invite somebody over to your department um, who can speak about drug and alcohol abuse, if you want to speak about that, you do not have the uh, correct information, reach out to, the, to me or somebody else in our fraternals. And then also relationship issues. And this is one of the great hallmarks of this, of this world because the world is actually turning around on, 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 on an axel of relationships. That's what the world is about, relationships. Um, somebody said once, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I don't remember who that, that was, no. but nevertheless, no matter, show me your friends and probably you'll know who it is. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And this is exactly how it is. And then we've got CIS, and that stands for critical incident stress. You can train your people, and there's a good segment of the work in your first manual about suicide also, about critical incident stress, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder, where you can set up a class format for your trainers or for your leaders 
and teach them about these topics so that they can lead and facilitate a group um, of, 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 of people in, in a peer support setting. The chapter can provide the training necessary for the leaders to develop the knowledge and skills needed. Now, you would ask me, say, Pastor, but I only can identify one suitable person. One. One is better than none. One is better than none. And that's what leadership is about. It's you standing out and doing something about it. So even if you have one person that's interested in leading a peer support group in your environment, that will be great. That will be absolutely fantastic. So what's the peer support group not? We know what it's not. The peer support group system is not a union meeting. Never think about it as a union meeting or give the platform to union representatives to speak to your peer support group. Because sooner enough, people will get frustrated with your group. And because then, of course, the union leaders will say, this is a good place to speak to the people in a union meeting. It's another story if the unions invite you to speak to their people. But it's not the same when, when you're, you've got a peer support group, for example, addressing the topic of alcohol abuse or addressing the topic of marriage or relationships, and then the union, unions take over. No, no. Uh, it, it's, it's a peer support group, nothing else. And it's also not a griping session. You know, you do not sit there and moan and groan about everything and how bad life is. Uh, you'll have to change and persuade their minds have to think positively about themselves. And also, it's not a therapy session. I mean, um, <clears throat> you, do not ther- you, you, not, you, you do not employ therapy uh, mechanisms in this peer support group because remember now, chaplain, you're actually not even involved. You're just coordinating, facilitating, but you've got other leaders leading this whole thing. If, you, if there is not a leader, of course, you can take the place of that because people will trust you. And then also an advanced session needs to be undertaken, a place to solve problems. This is a place, um, is not a place to solve any problems. For example, if people come to you on the peer support group and they tell you, listen, Pastor Chaplain, I've got a problem. Um, my kids uh, my kids run away. Um, this is not the place to, to solve that problem. But to tell people, listen, guys, my kid just ran away. Would you mind um, praying with me or, Encourage me, please. Um, how do I take care of my child better um, so that the child won't uh, run away again? And also, it's not a place to criticize the administration. And never think there's somebody not pimping on you inside of that session because they will run to the administration because they've got their own ideas about that. For example, when the new positions are advertised and, and they, and they um, tell the administration, listen, the chaplain allowed this peer support group to become a, a, a critique session of the administration. Um, soon enough, they will appoint this guy or lady and, and, and they will appoint them as a shop steward also uh, because they, are, um, they can tell a good story. So then, <clears throat> we go to the next slide, peer support dynamics. Um, let me go on, there we go. So peer support dynamics, um, peer support works, people. And if you feel it doesn't work, do not even try to deploy these, these skill sets because this will enhance your environment. It will better the functioning of, functioning of employees. It will actually save a lot of money, thousands and millions of rands, depending on the size of the organization. But it works. I've seen it work. We will discuss the following dynamics about um, peer support or the peer support dynamics. Now, the, first off, it's developing rapport. Remember what the, the word rapport means. In a better way, you can say empathy, sympathy, or you can say maybe close relationship or a bond. Um, so you have to develop a rapport in your sessions. And then facilitative listening can also be adjusted. You can, we're gonna discuss a little bit about this now in a, in a minute or two. Um, and we're going to discuss all of these seven points here. Every, every point's got a slide after this. Um, and then also confrontation. Um, ask open-ended questions immediately, as well as taking action. So let me not spend too much time on those. But let's just move forward to the first one. 
we are here now still on this slide actually this is the peer support dynamics and the first one of the outline is developing rapport this segment of the work will help you to facilitate the peer support group or even just setting it up with the right leadership or group so developing rapport you can em employ non-verbal behaviors yeah to develop this kind of rapport this type of you know um, sympathy or empathy or closeness um, sit face to face to the person when you speak to them even do, if you do counseling chaplain you, and you want to develop rapport with the client you have to sit face to face it, it, it doesn't help you sit like you know facing that side and you'll have to do this you'll have to sit face to face to this person if you can also maintain eye contact i know some people do not like to maintain eye contact but eye contact is uh is, is the best way yeah you know because you, your eyes will tell a story also lean forward if you can like this lean forward hmm. nodding like this smiling so often not smile when they tell you you know the, the grandmother just died <laughs> no choose your time well and then you have also paraverbal behaviors to um, to develop rapport. Now, paraverbal behaviors is like the tone of voice you've got. Um, when they speak and you reply on that, or they ask you a question in the group session or the peer support group, and, and you, 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 the tone of your voice indicates how you feel inside, you know. Um, what? What did you say? Or it all depends on how. You know, you, you tell it to them because your tone of voice will speak volumes. Also sounds of non-specific meaning, like grunts. <clears throat> I, whatever the case might be, these are all paraverbal behaviors. Then you've got verbal behaviors to develop rapport. Now, um, the verbal behavior, behavior is like assurance of confidentiality. As when you speak as a chaplain, and tell them, listen, guys, ladies, in this group, everything you say here will be confidential. And if we break up in smaller groups after this, and all of the team leaders help to facilitate the smaller groups, they are obliged, they need to protect your confidences unless you want to kill yourself, unless you want to kill somebody else, or unless you want to kill a group of people. And also, uh, to develop rapport um, in our verbal behaviors is assurance you are there to listen. You are there to listen. Um, even if you think blah blah blah, don't look like don't don't look like this guy when he's when a, when his wife is talking or the counselor is talking, whatever the case may be. Just try to be do your best to stay stay awake. Then we have um, facilitative listening, um, and the first thing about facilitative listening uh, is the echoing part. Repeating a word or a phrase for clarification. Um, if, the, if there's an officer in the room, and if the peer support group is a, a, an officer, a peer support room, uh, room uh, and he says, I got so angry at myself last night. Now, this is echoing, of course. The echoing will show them that you're listening. The peer supporter will say, angry, or you were angry. So it, it also seeks elaboration to be, to be sure that you understand this person correctly when you echo to do facilitative listening. That's what facilitative listening is all about. Secondly, the facilitative listening and to 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 do um, is to a reflection of content, summarizing what you heard. The employee would say, "What really bothers me about the incident is that I keep having these nightmares and flashbacks." He may not even say it so nicely as I did just now. He may say, "What really beep 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 bothers me." about the peep, peep, peep incident is that I keep having these peep, peep, peep nightmares and peep, peep, peep flashbacks. Don't say, oh my goodness, oh, do this, like something like that. Remember, there's their peer support group. Let them debrief. Let them speak out. Let them speak out their hearts. They will come to you afterwards and say, Chapman, oh my goodness, I really misbehave in such a bad manner. I'm so sorry. Next time it will be better. So then the peer supporter would say, your major concern then is that you are having flashbacks and nightmares. Now that is reflecting content of something that was just said. And also assurance of listening and seeking to understand this person. Because 
this person would want somebody to understand is not only about listening, but it's also reflecting. And this is what we call facilitative listening. It's a reflection of feeling without judgment, without conveying acceptance for what they're doing wrong or what they're doing right. But it's a reflection of content and feeling there are two, there are two different aspects of peer support expressing. For example, the empathy one, feeling with another, as well as the unconditional acceptance in that sense. Then we've got facilitative summarization. When you summarize what's just been said, it disclarifies if the peer support group is following what is being said and if they can you know, understand what the, the, the person just said. Let me see if I have this straight. I want to make sure I understand what you have been saying. And that's what we call facilitative summarization. To summarize and say, let me get you now. If a person enters your office, like the one down there in the picture, and he speaks about his wife, and he speaks about their ill, and so let me see if I understand, or if I have this straight now. You, you do not want couple therapy. You just want to debrief a little bit about marriage. But the goal is to have the individual feel you really hear what they are saying. That's the ultimate goal. Therefore, you facilitate the summarization and so that they can see, oh my goodness, wow, this guy is really listening to me. Yes, it will help your communication also. Um, wherever you communicate with people, it will help in that regard also. Then we've got the confrontation part. Now, the confrontation part is not always so nice. It's not getting angry, but pointing out discrepancies in the person's presentation of the problem. So, what the peer supporter will say. And these are the things that you'll have to train your peer supporters. You know, and if you want these slides, I can send it to you if you want to train them, of course. But then, John, you said earlier, you felt appreciation for everything the company has done for you since you lost your house. Then you said, this company stinks. Please help us here to understand. What do you mean? So clearly you are confronting him about two aspects. And he needs to explain why did he say this? Why did he say that? So also, Chaplin, you'll have to ask open-ended question to facilitate the session. Open-ended questions may not be answered with a yes or a no. A close question is, do you like your supervisor? That's a close question. That question can only be answered by yes or no. But an open-ended question, tell me about your supervisor. Now that's about relationships. When a person can tell you about your supervisor, is that the reason is because they understand them. Help the person explain their thoughts and feelings. Maybe if the supervisor was the topic, help them to explain why they think and feel like they do. Then we've got the immediacy. The immediacy refers to the present time. Sometimes an individual will drift into talking about the past. But Chaplin, it is important to help the person focus on their present year and now feelings and thoughts about the subject at hand. So, and, and, and therefore, with, you, couldn't, you cannot always delay because some people would want to address the problem right now. And it's best to do it right now. And unfortunately, some will just drift away, talking about the past forever and ever. Especially in churches, for example, when you gave some time for testimony, some people will stand up and they'll, and after you've said, listen, guys, ladies, we get give testimony about things that just happened the past month. And then they will start saying, oh, yeah, I can remember what God did for me in 1984. You know, I was driving here in this street, in this street, and this happened to me. Look at me now, 45 years you know, later. <laughs> that's, that's drifting into the past. We do not want to go there. We want to salute the future. We want to stand with the future. Then you'll have to take action with these. It doesn't help you if you, you know all of these things, but you need to get go to, over to action. You have to give them permission to say no to support. Give them permission to say no to support. If they do not want to be supported, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, I always tell the, the, the abusers here on the street, because we've got 
the ministry going here in Rustenburg, and we are really, really up and going here, my goodness. But unfortunately, many people, when you advise them, take them to the drug rehab, and they book themselves out after a month, um, and, and they've used heroin. Of course, they cannot be booked out after, after a month when using heroin, um, but they can also say no. And, there, and, and that's what, why I say this to you is when a person saying no to support it means it speaks out of their hearts. They don't want it. And if they don't want it, it's not going to help. It's like you pushing and pulling them aside and saying, listen, I need you to do this. I want you to do this. Don't disappoint me. And then what they'll do is they'll disappoint not only you, but they'll disappoint themselves because they are disappointing you. So do not pressurize them. They'll have to take action. They'll need to take action from their free will. One session is not all that is needed when you address communication problems, when you address marital problems. One session is not enough when you address all of these situations we are facing in our, uh, in our you know, environments. Several sessions are needed for adequate support and adjustments. I've seen that people who are involved in these kind of support groups, they do not, they do not want one-on-one -on -one counseling. Sometimes people would want one-on-one -on -one counseling with the chaplain, and you can identify those there in the peer support group. I want to see you to, tomorrow. I want to see you on Wednesday. Um, but you'll tell them privately, of course. Um, you can identify people you, will, you, you want to see from these support groups. Um, so, so, um, but remember, several sessions are needed. And then also, lastly, a referral to a mental health professional or for therapy is, is, is not a sin. If you see some people in that group really needs mental health professionals to address their needs, their special needs, get people involved. Don't hesitate. Don't be too late. Just do it. Because if you don't do it, they won't. They won't do it. Okay. Well, I see. What, praise God. See, I've got to let me just do this. Are there no questions? As I, all right, then, then we're good. We're good for tonight. Um, I would send you some homework. I will send you some homework that you'll need to do, please, um, in the morning. And then I'll also send you this recording for those ones who've missed the session tonight. And then I will send you a new post link to meet up with me again on a later stage. Okay. Should I show us the boys? All right. So, yes. Um, so, um, if there's no questions, I can, I can excuse you. After this prayer, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Have it not been for the amazing grace in this race, Lord, where we where we would have be, we been, Lord? Without you, we are nothing. But with you, Lord, we are everything. I want to pray for every chaplain on this room, in the precious name of Jesus, that you will bless them, Lord bountifully, miraculously, in the precious name of Jesus. Bless them far, bless them here, bless them all over, in Jesus' name. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, that we can still look upon ways how to impact our environments, how to impact our communities, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You'll be blessed if you don't have any questions.